Jenny Granberry took the art road less traveled by choosing a niched subject and color palette. An artist who believes in self-expression, vulnerability, and making your mark in the world one art piece at a time. Join us as we talk about embracing your unique preferences and why it's okay to be you, the trick to making your artwork pop, what being healthy creative actually means, and how to break away from the barrier of creating to please. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etrolab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etro. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. I think, you know, most kids like drawing, you know, kids are always coloring and doing crafts and stuff. And so I just kind of kept doing that instead of, you know, getting into sports or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I just always was drawing and my parents were really supportive and, you know, I did art classes in school and then, um, I would do painting classes after school or a painting class, um, with an art teacher. Um, I did that for several years. Um, and so, yeah, it was pretty much, I realized during school that if you just were kind of looked like you were writing, you could actually be in your sketchbook the whole time instead of paying attention to class. So, um, I enjoyed that. Um, and then I went, uh, I got a bachelor of fine arts, uh, at Midwestern state university, um, with an emphasis in painting. And that was, it was like 10 years ago. It doesn't feel like that long ago. And, um, yeah, I, uh, majored in painting in college and, um, I guess the, uh, career part of it is that I worked some odd jobs for, um, actually quite a few years and, um, you know, doing things, I don't know. I guess I worked one job where we did uh, like faux finishing on furniture and we did scenic backdrops and things like that. So that's kind of artsy. Um, but I started teaching uh, full time. Well, kind of full time. I do a bunch of different little gigs, but mm -hmm. I am an, an educator uh, with various art products. But then I also teach art classes, both online and in person. And uh, that's kind of where I am now, um, career wise. Um, creatively, though, I would say that I kind of, you know, I was working, I went and did college, which has a lot of um, purpose there. You know, you got to do your art to, you know, pass your class. And there's that exhibition at the end and then got out of college. And I was, you know, just still trying to create work and kind of grappling with all of that. And, um, you know, I don't know, it was kind of a, you know, and it, this is like 10 years of time. Um, and so it's just, I don't know. I feel like during that time making work where I was hoping that people would notice me or galleries would notice me or, you know, whoever. Um, and then 2020, as we all know, um, was the year everyone's <laughs> lives fell apart and, uh, uh, definitely, uh, did for me. And, um, I kind of in the really difficult time, uh, kind of had a turning point creatively, um, and I think that going through a difficult time and, you know, putting artistic career ambition off to the side and focusing on art as something that could help me, um, deal with some really troubling issues. Um, I think that that actually brought me to a new creative point. And actually I have a more healthy creative uh, practice now, um, due to that. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say I'm thankful for the bad times because I would have just rather it not happened, but, um, you know, I do feel now I'm kind of pulling myself back together in a, um, healthier way. So that's where I am now, that art journey. Awesome. I, I was just fascinated because I've, I've talked with several artists here on the podcast and the 2020 like era or time where, you know, the world shifted significantly. 
everyone had mm-hmm. their own journey. And I would say that it has been positive for a lot of people in the sense, I mean, creatively. And for you, it sort of opened up a new creative path in a, in a sense. So would you say that this style that you have right now, was did that start in, in 2020? Or has this always been the style? Because you do, uh, we're talking offline, and you do bright colors, right? And with somber subjects. <laughs> And we'll touch on that more in detail when we talk about your mini, the live demo and the mini workshop that you'll be doing with, with Etcher. But can you share a little bit more about that? The, the subjects, um, did, did start, start, it started recently or was that always been the, the subjects and as well as colors that you've always been fascinated with? All right, yeah, yeah, this is interesting. So I... Uh, worked with a really bright palette um, for a long time. You know, it's, it had the brightest colors. They're the most exciting and you can kind of neutralize them down to be, you know, have your neutral tones and dark tones. Um, and so my thought was always get the brightest tube of paint. And that actually is the most economical way to purchase paint. Um, and it's fun, you know, to work with hot pink. Um, and so those were the colors that were interesting to me just on their own. And so it's like, regardless of what I wanted to paint, if it was like a skull or some like sad portrait or something or florals or a bird or whatever was interesting me on that day, I would use that palette. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that during 2020, I did, um, shift to a more neutral palette. And in my personal art practice, I am actually working a lot more, um, you know, with a very limited kind of earthy textural palette. Mm -hmm. And I think probably the difference here is there is a separation that I've started to put between my personal art practice and what I'm teaching. So the, uh, you know, really vivid, fun skull painting, um, was something that I, found a lot of joy in the color choice and that I wanted to share that sense of fun and excitement with, um, you know, those who are going to take the class with me. And so that was my kind of, uh, thought process behind that color palette. Interesting. You mentioned that in your personal, you, you are more into earthy neutral palette, right? So there's this separation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you're teaching, you you, you love the bright colors and then the subjects that you create with it. I, I also find a find it really interesting because bright colors and then the subjects are, you know, w- with the live demo that you did and the mini workshop that you'll be doing, it's a skull. Um, for the subjects, uh, Jenny, I'm, I'm curious also, was, was that a personal preference or was there any sort of influence as to why you chose um, skull specifically for as a subject to teach. Yeah. Um, so, um, portrait work is something that I am interested in and, you know, I know that there's a lot of portrait painting courses available. And so I was like, what have I not seen? And I was like, psychedelic tie dye skull. I haven't seen anything like that. And I thought that would be really eye catching and fun. Um, but I also chose it because, um, there is a sense of, um, tradition, um, in doing an anatomical study, you know, going dating all the way, way back in the good old art days, uh, people were drawing and painting skulls as a way to learn how to better paint portrait work. Um, and so what I really like about the skull is that, um, you know, we're rooted in something very classic and traditional, but also skulls are very, uh, you know, they're kind of wicked and, um, there's a bit of an edge to it. And so I, I was really tickled at the idea to kind of put those two together. I love the thought process that you just share when it comes to the subject. And you're absolutely right when you said that there's not a lot of like anatomical, um, psychedelic type of 
like illustrators or like subjects that people normally teach in an art class. And when I saw your, I was watching your live demo, I was like, oh, this is so cool. I have a friend who's very much into skulls, like everything skulls. And I know that she would love your class. Um, she's also a watercolor artist, uh, but I haven't seen her um do something similar to uh to what you did for the live demo and your upcoming class so it's it's really interesting and then the contrast of its bright colors um which is you know mm-hmm. really good because the, there is that contrast now um so just taking a few steps back you did mention it the past 10 years you have done like several jobs still relating to art right and you've done teaching. I think by profession, you said earlier, um, you are a painting instructor. I think that's what's also what I've read in your bio. Okay. But you've also done a lot of exhibits in Texas and in New York. So can you share a little bit more about that journey um, of showcasing your works? And has this always been the, and it's also watercolor, right? Most of them, or did you also do um, oil mm. for your exhibits? So I actually feel like I'm a little lacking in the amount of work that I've exhibited. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done a few, um, I've done a few shows, uh, here in Austin and the surrounding, uh, central Texas area. Um, I've shown work, um, in New York once and I, um, did a study abroad there, but I would say that, um, if I were to give myself a uh, growth area or something I could be a bit better at is being a little better at putting my work out there in the world, like, Mm. um, you know, at the gallery type setting. So that's something I'm actively working on now. Okay. That's good. When it comes to those showcasing your work, this is also an, an interesting topic because for a lot of seasoned artists or for anyone who might be starting out, it's always a feeling that I'm not sure if I'm ready to showcase my works. Mm-hmm. Am I ready to be criticized? Am I ready to receive feedback? Or is it really ready? Am I that good enough to say that and wear that artist hat and showcase my work whether it's in a gallery or even just putting it out on social media for people to see what is your take on that given that you have done your share of showcasing your work sure um i think that anytime you're doing any type of creative expression it's a vulnerable act um and it there is going to be a level of discomfort with that and I think that I think that you just kind of have to confront it and kind of get over it a little bit. Um, I don't know. I just submitted an exhibition proposal uh, this morning, actually, and I was reading through what I had written, and I was just like, "Oh, this feels kind of personal." And someone's going to read this and reject me, or someone's going to read this and they might think that I'm dumb for writing all that out or whatever. And it's just kind of like, I don't know. Life is short. You just got to do it. And I've kind of, um, I I have kind of gathered that in most circumstances, people are actually ready to enjoy whatever creative uh, thing that you do, you know, whether it's painting or something else. Um, People are generally kind and supportive. Um, And when you get people who are critical, I almost feel like it's a little bit more of a reflection on the critical person and maybe not so much of your art. Um, But I do think that there are um, moments where you might look at something where you're like, I feel like I'm not ready because my work isn't good enough. And I think the question is to go, okay, what specifically isn't good enough? Is my drawing not accurate enough? Um, Am I not uh, designing my work with a good composition or something like that? I think that we can always um, look at our own work um, with a critical eye 
in, you know, separating out the emotion of feeling insecure um, and actually looking at it a little bit more intellectually and try to problem solve, you know, what could I do to my work so that I feel more confident showing it out there in the world? That's a really good advice, uh, Jenny. I personally, when I started, because I do watercolor on the side, and one of the things that really sort of a, a blocking point for me then was, I don't know, because there are a lot of pe people who are already doing florals, like loose watercolor florals. And personally, I was thinking, no, this, I'm just, I don't want to be just another person who does watercolor florals. And you know, it's it's not as good as those people who have already been doing watercolor florals. In your case, um, your your style is very distinct. The choices of the subjects that you that you paint, it's it's so different. It's it's not common. Was that a personal choice? Because you did mention earlier that you saw a need of, you know, not a lot of people are teaching this uh, type of subject with this color palette. Um, was that also a factor as to why you continue to create these types of art pieces, specifically with a focus on anatomy or psychedelic um, subjects? Um, so I would say that I, at this point, at a point in my creative journey after post 2020 badness. Um, I want to just paint whatever I want to paint. Um, if it's, you know, for a work sort of thing, of course I will, you know, do my best work for, uh, my paid jobs. But right. when I am creating my own personal art, um, I'm going to do exactly what I want. And, um, that is a freedom that I have found, um, and really listening to what that means. And so, you know, one day that might be something that feels very, uh, vulnerable and personal and is a figurative painting. Um, and then like the last thing I painted was a bird on a skateboard because I thought it was funny and it made me happy to paint that. Um, and I don't know, it just, life is kind of short, you know, things are happening all the time. If I'm not having fun creating something, if I'm not following my own desires, I mean, what am I doing? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not getting paid. So why am I creating things I don't want to make, you know, I should do what I want. And so that's, um, I think that if you are truly in tune with your own, um, kind of, wants and whims and, you know, things that are interesting. I think that uh -huh. you will inevitably end up in a place that feels authentic and, um, something that feels, uh, right. I love that. Um, I, I think for anyone who, who's listening right now, especially if you are starting out that authenticity and doing something that you enjoy doing, I, I think that's also one of the things that you highlighted, especially having, you are at the point right now that you do create what you want to create, that freedom, that liberty to be able to express yourself fully through your art. I think that's liberating and very encouraging for anyone who is starting out in, in their creative training. Because there is this notion, of course, like, again, when I was starting out that I would want to do something what everyone else is doing because, you know, it's getting more um, attention. Uh, it's getting more likes on Facebook or Instagram, maybe. And so I'm going to do that because mm -hmm. pretty much what everyone is doing. But what I love about your style, Jenny, is, and also what you're sharing with other people through your classes is that there is, one, there is a need for this because not a lot of people are giving that much attention to this type of subjects. But at the same time, this is what I love to do. And it's not something that, you know, a, a lot of people are teaching and because there is a huge demand for it. But this is you expressing yourself fully and then sharing it with other people, especially those who would want to paint specific subjects like what you do. Now, speaking of classes, you'll be having yours with us with Etcher on May 8th. You just did your live demo and I really enjoyed watching it. I was like, this is so interesting. Bright colors and then the skull. And, you know, I've 
painting portraits, a lot of people struggle with it, especially with faces, um, but skulls specifically. So take us, uh, can you share a little bit more about, um, I know you have a sample of what you did for the live and demo and what you will be sharing with us or teaching for your mini workshop, which is happening on May 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So do watch out for it if you're listening or watching this episode. So Jenny, can you share a little bit more about the class and what they will be um, getting, learning from the mini workshop? Yeah, so we're going to start with a uh, wet on wet technique. So that's kind of what was at the uh, live demo where um, we get to take all of those really fun colors and let them do their watercolory weird thing. And um, I thought that was a really fun way to start uh, this project off. Um, I know that, you know, getting those first brush strokes down can be um, like a scary thing for a lot of painters. And so to kind of start with something that's completely, you know, free and fun and engaging, I think that's a really, um, I don't know, it gets your painting off to a really uh, fun and upbeat start. Um, and so once that dries, then you've got your um, kind of this field of color um, to work on top of. And we'll do uh, what's called a value study, which is, you know, a fancy way of saying, you know, different shades of black or black and white, except instead yeah. of white, it's going to be fun colors. Um, and so we'll go through and we'll um, develop the structure of the skull and create that anatomical study because, you know, I mean, anatomical studies can, it can be a little boring. It can be a little dry. A black and white painting can feel boring sometimes. And so it's like, well, how can we kind of make this more exciting? Um, and uh, I think that a skull also offers um, nice moments of uh, really extreme value shifts. Um, so there's really light parts and dark parts yes. within the same subject. And there are soft transitions and really hard edges on it as well. And so I think it's a really good subject that gives the, um, the painter a chance to um, really delve into a lot of different uh, watercolor problems that you encounter when you're painting. Um, and then also to skulls, um, them having such an iconic uh, look to them, like the, the two eye holes and the nose hole yeah. and the teeth and everything. It also, um, it, it's a, it's a high success subject matter. I think even if your skull is a little wonky, even if it's mm -hmm. a little off, it's still going to look like a tie dye skull. And so I, I like the idea of everybody being able to finish the class with something that still looks really cool. And something of their own. I know. Cause, um, this is like this call is like, you're absolutely right. It's very iconic. And thank you for sharing like a, it's actually very detailed of what to expect from your mini workshop is that it's sort of, they're getting two for one, like the, you, you will do like mm -hmm. brush strokes. You will learn about the colors and how to mix them and layering it out on paper, doing the wet on wet technique. But at the same time, you'll do the um, value intensity, like what you said, the, so of course, when you create the skull, so there's shades of darker uh, and then lightness of it. And also the idea of drawing the skulls. Um, I think that's one really plus point, especially if you are a beginner and to be able to finish that piece. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a very iconic piece. I mean, subject. And um, it, it's something that I can picture on my wallpaper or on my wall. I mean, literally, you can, you can absolutely do a lot with, with that um, painting. So if you do want to catch that, class um and paint alongside with jenny then do watch out for the mini workshop that's happening on may 8th at 2 p.m eastern time we'll also include everything um on the show notes the links as well as jenny's instagram if you want to learn more about and see her works which brings me to my other question jenny i i was also browsing um through the to your feed and i was really impressed with the study of the hands that you did um um, you 
because I what I tried <laughs> drawing and painting hands, you know, layering colors. It's so freaking hard. Um, it's always a little wonky. The fingers are <laughs> bad, and it doesn't look like I am. I'm not good with um dimensions and you know sizing. It's always been a problem of mine. So, but that study, I was like. Wow. And I, I was reading through the comments and people were like, oh, this is so good. Um, can you share a little bit more about that? And any techniques that you can offer when it comes to drawing hands, maybe? Because, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's something that we don't always, you know, use, right? Uh, with, with everything. But to take the time to really study and paint them, that's extra. So can you share a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, that study that you did. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. The hand paintings were for a uh, online workshop I taught that was specifically about um, how to paint and draw hands. And um, yeah, uh, the hands I think are a really great opportunity, um, kind of like a, a crash course in anatomy again. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the hands have a lot of variation in color that will come up when you're painting flesh tones. So you're learning that. Um, and then the hands are also going to have a lot of hard edges and soft edges in them. Um, and so uh, I think that the hands are a great way to uh, get into uh, figure drawing or, or even portraiture to an extent, because it does require a degree of accuracy that you also want to have um, when you're doing a, a portrait, you know, drawing a face. Um, and so, yeah, when looking at the hand, um, you know, I think about it, I'm like looking at my hand now, um, yeah. you know, thinking about the drawing as separate from the painting um, in the way that I would approach it in watercolor. And so looking at that hand in the drawing phase, you know, starting out thinking about it in sections, you know, thinking about it almost like a mitt, you know, where all mm -hmm. the fingers are together and then the thumb is kind of separate yeah and then kind of going from there and it's a very crude like almost mapping out of the kind of sections each finger has you know three um kind of tapered rectangles and you know mm -hmm. where does the knuckle of this finger line up with that one and when I look at drawing something like a hand I always look at it like solving a puzzle um you know getting all the little pieces all these little rectangles to all kind of line up in a way that looks roughly human. Uh, that's always our goal at the end of the day. Um, but I guess my tip specifically for hands is to think about the uh, fingers as tapered uh, rectangles instead of long skinny lines. Uh, Cause sometimes things end up looking like balloon animals or spaghetti or something. And we really want to keep the structure and the sections of it. I love when you talk about like the wiggly thing, because that's what I do. You know, normally you, you put your hand down and you try to judge, but you, you mentioned about shapes and that's really a very interesting take when it comes to drawing hands uh, and fingers. I think that's something I'm going to try, or I think this is going to be called for another class. Um, with Johnny. So if, if you do want to check it out again, then, um, you do have a website. Uh, we'll include that as well um, on the show notes. But if you're interested, that's jennygranberry.com. Um, that's Jenny's website. And if, for, for Instagram, it's the same thing, right, Jenny? Jenny Granberry. It's just yeah. fact. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's where I saw the the hand study, and I was like, ah, oh, this is so cool because that has always been a problem for me, and I know I'm not alone. A lot of people do would want to paint. There's something about an uh, anatomical subjects that people gravitate towards too, but at the same time, people are sort of intimidated to try it out. So this class, this mini workshop that you're going to have with Jenny Woods Calls is really a good stepping stone for you to learn more about if you want to really push through with portraiture or painting subjects related to anatomy. Um, I was just looking at your, 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 you raise your hands and this is something that I always want to ask you. Um, the, the floral um, tattoo that you have on your, on your arm, was it something that you designed or 
yeah the other oh yeah okay so there's two it's right like, i know i can't figure out which way to okay can you share a little i've got yeah i've got several oh. this one's floral okay it's really cool was it something that you designed yeah. or was it something that yeah <laughs> Um, so no, I haven't, uh, designed any of, uh, my tattoos. Um, I, you know, it's kind of leave it to the professionals. I know that okay. you might think, you know, drawing watercolor yeah. stuff is art. So tattoos are art, but there's actually Play a whole discipline and aesthetic and practice to tattoo design. And my thought is, is if I'm going to pay a bunch of money to get tattooed, I want them to do the design work. I do enough art on my own. So okay. all designed by the pros. Okay. okay. Noted on that. I, I'm, I'm scared of needles. I never want to try, but I have friends who are, they really love it. And when I saw you, uh, when you bought art, so I was like, oh, it's like, you know, it's very artsy. But at the same time, it's so cool because that takes courage because there's like huge, like, and I was thinking that maybe she was the one who designed it. But like what you said, leave it to the professionals. It's, you know, um, it, it has an entirely different discipline. You should, you should get some work done. <laughs> I'm going to think about it. Um, probably just a small one. Maybe, maybe. Um, but yeah. Jenny. Um, yeah, I, good. I, start small yeah. and then. Work and then try it. Okay. Noted on that. Jenny, thank you so much. Um, I had so much fun um, chatting with you. And again, um, it's a really interesting subject, the one that you will be teaching with us. I watched your live demo and was like, this is so cool. I, I haven't seen this um, subject from a lot of artists and the, the colors, the right colors, making it with somber subjects. It's just... It, it's like a marriage of two different things, but in your live demo, there's there's synchrony. I mean, you were able to merge them together and create this beautiful piece that's bright, but at the same time, it's a somber subject. So, um, if you are interested again to learn more about her techniques and if you enjoyed what she shared earlier, then do uh, sign up for the class again. That's happening on May. 8 at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can check out more of the details on their Etcher Studio website, or you can check out Jenny's Instagram. That's Jenny Granberry, um, as well as her website, jennygranberry.com. Jenny, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with me. Um, and um, I look forward to um, seeing more of your works and at the same time, your classes um, with Etcher. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been fun. I'll speak to you again soon and um, take care and um, all the best with your classes. And I know a lot of people are learning from you because you're also a painting instructor. So all the best with um, what you do and we'll see more of your works, whether on the gram, on your website, or on your future classes. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny inspired me to push through with the things I'm passionate about, to take a different route and be not afraid of trying my hands on something new. What about you? Have you tried pursuing something you've always wanted to do? Do share with us your stories through the blog posts associated with this podcast at etrolab.com slash Jenny. We would love to hear your thoughts, so please drop us a five-star review on the Apple Podcast where you can find us on YouTube at Etro Studio. And, oh, hitting the subscribe button is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll catch you again next time. Until then, let's make more art.